Thank you for watching this video. Death is something that we don't like to think too much about. And yet, each one of us wonders what happens when we die. It's not an experience that we can talk to other people about. And it's something which uh, fascinates all of us. We all seem to think that we will live on after we die. But what are the facts concerning this? In the next few moments, we're going to look to see what the Bible teaches concerning what happens when we die. If we were to look for information on the religious views that exist in relation to life after death, we would find that from the earliest times, there has been a, a tendency to believe that a person has a part of them that uh, lives on after they die. We can go back to the 8th century BC and find evidence amongst the ancient Egyptians that they believed in this. And the pyramids show how that these ornate tombs, complete with items which was supposed to help the individual in their afterlife were constructed on the belief that that person would live on after their mortal days. Those beliefs have been uh, passed down over the centuries and now form part of mainstream Christian beliefs. If we were to look at Wikipedia to find um, some ideas about what information it provides, we would find that it states, as we have on the screen before us, the idea of the immortal soul as being believed by many Christians. And this too has the same idea as we have previously spoken about, about there being a, an element in of an individual that lives on after they die. But Wikipedia does record that there are those who do not believe that this is a case. The Christadelphians are actually named by a Wikipedia as being a body of believers who believe that the dead do not possess a soul which is separate from the body and are unconscious until the resurrection. And this is founded upon the clear teaching of scripture as we will uh, uh, explore together now. So what of this word soul? We talk about it as being something that might live on after us. But the Bible use of that uh, word presents a different picture. If we go into the early record of Genesis, we find there a verse that describes the creation of uh, uh, animals and uh, other creatures, and one that talks about the creation of man. And in the case of the animals, it says that every living creature that moved was created by God. Now that word for creature is exactly the same word that is then used a little later on in the second chapter of Genesis, where it states that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now what was different about the two creations? because we could say that man became a living creature, which would have a consistency in the way in which the original Hebrew word is translated. Man breathes in a breath of life into dust. And the scriptures go on to teach how that this process reverses on death. And it's the same that is spoken of concerning men or concerning animals. The psalmist talks about death and says that a man's breath goeth forth, he returneth to the earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. No consciousness after death. And uh, 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 another psalmist speaks about the comparison between man and the animals when he says that, nevertheless, man being in honour abideth not, is like the beast that perish. Man that is in honour and understandeth not is like the beast that perish. Both men and animals are described as souls, and both, it is stated, do not have any consciousness after death. 
In fact, when we look at the uh, word soul that is in the Hebrew Old Testament, the Greek New Testament, the original languages on which are, uh, form part of our Bible, in the majority, the overwhelming majority of instances, that word describes something that is either subject to death, in danger of death, or being uh, saved out of death. So where did the idea of the immortal soul come into Christianity? It was something that was brought into Christianity from Greek philosophy. And the early Christians, those who believed in the first century, it is commonly accepted, did not believe in the immortal soul. It, it was Greek philosophers such as Socrates, Plato and Aristotle who uh, thought that there was a separation between a, an immortal part of an individual and the mortal. At one, Thomas Aquinas took this view into Christianity. It's the idea of their being, as part of any person, an essence of the divine, as it is all often spoke, spoken about. And it mirrors the idea of the humanist when he comes to uh, accept that there is a God. Note what it says there. A body, the body is responsible for our behaviour. And our behaviour is conditioned by all sorts of things. But look what is omitted from that. Personal responsibility. And once you split it into two, the body can excuse what you do. Your soul is preserved from that blame. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches something totally different. Now, when Christianity absorbed this idea of an immortal soul into their beliefs, they had to amend other beliefs. For example, when, soul, when a body dies, what happens to the soul? And the ideas were developed how that if a person had been good, it would ascend up into heaven. But what about those where the people weren't good? Well, there had to be a place to contain those souls. And so the idea of hell was designed. The scripture teaches otherwise. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ, no man hath ascended up, into, up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. It's categoric. And as far as hell is concerned, in that same scripture that we referred to before psalm 49 the inward thought of individuals says the psalmist is that their houses shall continue forever their dwelling places to all generations they call lands after their own names they, they seem to go on without uh, thinking that they will die but as he says like sheep they're laid in the grave death shall feed on them in the same way as sheep do and nobody would suggest that sheep have a, a, an immortal soul or that it goes to hell and yet that word grave that concerns the, uh, where a sheep goes when it dies is exactly the same word that otherwise in the Old Testament is translated hell. And you can see the way in which these ideas that were necessary when the idea of an immortal soul was taken into Christianity now developed other doctrines which led to other uh, misunderstandings of what the Bible teaches. Now let's just see the clear teaching of scripture as the Bible deals with what happens on death. And note the clarity of what has been said. For in death there is no remembrance of thee that is God. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? The dead praise not the Lord, neither that any that go down into silence. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead no, not anything. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so the soul of the Son is mine, the soul of the sinner, that shall die. Clearly teaching that there is no consciousness in, de in death and no ability for anyone to communicate with the dead. The simple fact that is being put before us by Scripture is that when we die, we lose consciousness and our bodies then decompose. 
How about scientists and what do they think happens on death? We're going to refer to a man, Stephen Hawking, uh, known because of his, uh, 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 he suffered with motor neuron disease and yet was a prominent scientist. He wrote a book, Brief History of Time, and it was in the Sunday Times bestseller list for uh, 237 weeks. And on his deathbed, he was asked the question, what, what would happen to him? And he bluntly said, when we die, we return to dust. He didn't believe in the Bible, but that's what his scientific conclusion was. And what does the, the Bible say, say? Back in Genesis, when God impose the sentence of death because of the sin of the man and the woman, Adam and Eve. In verse 19 of chapter 3, he said, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. And note the next words, For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Unwittingly, a scientist has agreed in totality with the clear scriptural teaching. So far, we've been drawn to the conclusion on the teachings of scripture that as far as death is concerned, there is little difference between man and animals. But scripture doesn't end the matter there because there is a difference in relation to God's purpose with both and the capacity of both to respond to God's word. The difference between man and animals is man's ability to think in the way that he does, and to uh, develop ideas and to uh, act in accordance with those ideas. Now God said on the creation of man, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And it was the Lord God who formed man of the dust of the ground. The word Lord there, is the personal name of God. And so man, God was created by man, by the Lord God. He was created in the likeness of God. Let us make man in our image. And he had the faculties to be able to develop the same character as God. Now, if we were go, to go into the book of Exodus in the 33rd, 34th chapters, we would learn there that Moses asked God to show him his glory. And what was shown to Moses was the character of God. And the purpose of, uh, the, uh, of God with the earth was then uh, disclosed to Moses on a later occasion when God says this, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. It's God's purpose that all men, should develop the same character that he has and that the, the whole earth might reflect that character in a future time. Now the problem was that when man was created he was given a commandment and he was forbidden from eating of a particular tree. Now one of the purposes of the commandment was to assist the man by exercising his own free will to trust in what God was saying and to have confidence in that character of God as being a perfect character that was thinking for the best of the man. But he doubted it and was uh, uh, tempted to eat of the fruit that was on that particular tree. It was the serpent that provided the temptation to the woman, but the result was that man was cursed as a result. And that's why the uh, curse came upon man that we've referred to before, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. But that isn't all that the record in Genesis says, because the record in Genesis goes on to speak of the way in which this condemnation would be overcome. As far as the woman was concerned, and the serpent, the record uh, uh, says that God promised that he would put enmity between the serpent and the woman and between the seed of her, the ser serpent and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
and although we do not have time to develop it, that was a prediction of one who would come, who would bruise the head, a lethal blow to temptation to sin, but would be bruised in his own heel. Although man was failed, had failed, God in his perfect character was showing to man the way in which his love would uh, uh, overcome and that he would provide his own son to die that man might have hope of life. One who would truly show the character of God as the Lord Jesus did. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. It's absolutely certain that he died. The experienced executioners of the Roman Empire would not make a mistake on that. He was put into a tomb and there he lay for three days and miraculously he, he was given a life after three days and was resurrected from the grave. Now the disciples, apostles, were teaching this to the people and the early chapters of the Acts of the Apostles uh, record their teaching. And Peter on the day of Pentecost speaks to the people and tells them about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ by quoting an Old Testament scripture. The Old Testament scripture describes a, a time when there would be one who would ri ri rise from the dead. It says this, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or in the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to seek corruption. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in the hell or grave, neither his flesh did see corruption. It had been prophesied beforehand, and now was being confirmed by the actual event of the raising of the Lord Jesus from the dead. And the Lord Jesus' resurrection shows to us the blessing that can come upon us if we are to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow after in his commandments. He speaks to us through his word. He says unto to us, as he, as, as, as he said to uh, 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 people in the New Testament day, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. It's a clear promise that although we may lose consciousness in death, Although our bodies may decompose, the Lord Jesus Christ can raise us from the dead at his return. The Apostle Paul uh, confirmed this fact when being examined and, att and attesting to his faith, that he had a hope towards God, which the Jews themselves also allow, that there should be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. So there has to be a judgment between those who are raised those who are described as just will be able to uh, participate in the new life that will be given to them at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how and when will this take place? Well those same apostles looked forward to a time when God's kingdom will be set up on the earth. And they asked the Lord Jesus shortly before his ascension whether he would then set up that kingdom. But the angels answered the question when they said to uh, them that uh, he shall come in like manner as if you have seen him go into heaven. A clear teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth. And in that day, as the Lord said, the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And so the uh, wonderful promise is given to us that although we may not have consciousness when we die, we certainly do not have an immortal soul, but that doesn't reduce the great hope that we have of being given life when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And also those who we love who have also died in faith will receive that same blessing. The Apostle Paul spoke of it in this way, concerning the life that would come to pass in that day. 
he reckoned that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so, as far as we are as individuals are concerned, those that have followed the teaching of Jesus will be given a new life, free of health difficulties and other difficulties, and live forever in God's new world. We are offered that opportunity now, but he requires us to respond to the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ to enable us to have a part in that great blessing that will take place when he returns. They may not be conscious to us when we die, but when we are raised again, there will certainly be consciousness and the participation in a wonderful new life. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.